Welcome to Frame Consulting Services. I'm Carl Frame, Principal of FCS. We've been serving the materials and ceramic industry since 1987. I'd like to present to you a short video uh, that I think you'll find interesting, at least I hope you will. And it's based upon a lecture I use at the University of Kansas in my Science of Materials course. It's not one of the main lectures. It's one of the add-ons I present to my students. Uh, and this is an area of technology that has fascinated me quite a bit. Uh, so I hope it'll fascinate you too as well. And it's called Mimicking Mother Nature's Materials. Now Mother Nature has really worked some miracles in developing through evolution uh, some very interesting materials for a wide variety of applications. And we're going to look at just a few of these. Uh, we now have some new tools, relatively new tools, such as a scanning electron microscope and a number of others, where we're learning about and able to learn about Mother Nature's very novel designs. Uh, they've been around for eons, long before mankind, um, and we're now uh, just beginning to really be able to see what has happened here and then to mimic it and put it to good use using modern materials for all kinds of interesting applications. This is relatively new technology, most of the ones I'm going to show you anyway. So we're starting to mimic these Mother Nature's designs. Um, we're using more durable materials and modern manufacturing technologies and science, including things like DNA, in order to do it. Uh, and we've only really started on this quest. Uh, we've got a long ways to go and a lot of opportunities here. It's kind of a, a fun area to look at. This is uh, the foot of a gecko. As you probably know, geckos can walk on walls and on ceilings. Um, and uh, this is a picture of the foot of a gecko. Uh, they walk on ceilings, they walk on walls, uh, but they do not have suction cups like an octopus has. Well, how do they do that? It's kind of interesting. Um, I was in Indonesia on the island of Sumatra uh, many years ago and checked into a motel late at night and there were geckos running all over the place catching bugs. I kind of hoped when I got in bed to uh, turn the light off that they wouldn't take a dump on me from the ceiling, but uh, I was uh, consoled by the fact they were eating bugs that I probably didn't want to have around. What they have on their feet is microscopic fibers, for lack of a better word. I'll show you a picture in a minute. Um, and these fibers, when they touch a surface, have enough van der Waals forces between all these very small fibers to hold the feet and the gecko to a ceiling. And this is what it looks like under the scanning electron microscope. Color has been added for effect. Um, and you see these fibers with the split ends, if you will. Uh, I, I guess it's sort of like split ends of hair. I don't have to worry about that much anymore. Um, but these surfaces here uh, and at the end of these fibers are what allow a gecko to generate enough attraction to the ceiling to be able to walk on it. This is a lotus leaf, um, water lily, if you will. Uh, and you'll notice that water beads up on the surface. Now, it's not because the surfaces are very smooth and waxy. In fact, they're not smooth. Um, these leaves are immensely hydrophobic, which allows water to beat up on it. Water is repelled from that surface. Uh, and you get these nice beads of water on a water lily. Uh, man is now mimic mimicking this function of the lotus leaf. The lotus leaf has nano bumps, very small bumps on its surface that cause water droplets to be nearly spherical. Not quite, but close to it. And this is what it looks like. Um, and so these water drops are all beaded up on tops of these little bumps. The bumps actually have little protrusions on their own that are in a micron range or smaller. Uh, and they uh, really uh, allow the water droplets to stand up on these surfaces. That's what it looks like, um, uh, again, under the microscope. Well, we've made copies of that, and this is a man-made copy of the surface of a uh, lotus leaf. So we can make these, what we hope will be, uh, viable self-cleaning surfaces, including clothing, that you don't have to wash because it just doesn't get dirty. Things don't stick to it. Uh, I can imagine a, a car um, painted with material like this or surfaced with this. I don't know what the cost would be. Um, where water just beads up on it and, and the car doesn't get dirty. Car wash so often. This is a super hydrophobic butterfly wing. Um, and uh, this uh, is very interesting. Um, it is composed of uh, 
uh, intricate ridges and waxy coverings. Uh, and it is more hydrophobic than is the lotus leaf. It will repair a water droplet 40% faster than what happens on a lotus leaf. Uh, can we use this on aircraft wing to prevent icing or other surfaces where we want to have a super hydrophobic material? Lots of potential here uh, for us to copy this design uh, that Mother Nature uh, made. This was from National Geographic, by the way, in 2014. So it's fairly recent information. Pterosaur wing membranes. Well, you know, we don't have any pterosaurs flying around us, uh, I think, thank God, um, to allow us to study the wing structure, the membrane itself. Uh, but these uh, pterosaurs, which, who lived from 288 to 66 million years ago, they died out with all the rest of the dinosaurs, um, and uh, they're reptiles, but uh, they died out when uh, the giant meteor, as we think, hit off the Yucatan Peninsula and wiped out a lot of uh, life on the Earth, including the pterosaurs. Uh, they, some of them were very large, not all of them. Uh, the largest weighed 550 pounds and had a 34-foot wingspan, uh, about the weight of a pony, I guess, uh, and they were able uh, to, re to fly over oceans. They, f they were long distance gliders and flyers. And the wing membrane on the pterosaurs had to be very taut for them to be able to have the energy to do that. And uh, the uh, development of this uh, wing membrane uh, through evolution um, allowed them to do this. And pterosaurs looked like this. They weren't very pretty. Uh, and the wing structures uh, shown here, uh, they flew literally over oceans, uh, and uh, that's something very few animals today uh, can even conceive of. Uh, they were long distance flyers, thousands of miles. Uh, the wing membrane, we get this from the fossil record, believe it or not, um, had very long, thick fibers uh, that were crisscrossed with fibers of different diameter, and these crisscrossed fibers with thick fibers controlled how much fluttering occurred in the wing. And fluttering, of course, causes loss of energy, loss of efficiency. Uh, the fibers individually moved under the effects of high air pressures uh, on the wing membrane. Uh, and basically, the variety of dimensions and their orientation meant that they oscillated in, in the wind under uh, at opposing frequencies. And they canceled each other out. So evolution developed a material that had this property. And that gave a very steady wing membrane. So evolution was really quite a fantastic tool that Mother Nature used to develop um, some very interesting materials and for a very wide variety of applications. We might be using this to develop and are looking at using this to develop a tent fabric uh, that will not flap in the wind so much uh, and will improve stability in high winds. So we might be able to use this on light aircraft um, and parachutes, and gliders, and so forth. Uh, so it has some real applications. This was in Scientific American magazine in 2014 as well. We all, when we walk through brush, uh, know the uh, problem of, of getting burrs in your socks and on your pants, your dog's fur, uh, and other animals, of course, also uh, get burrs caught in their fur. Uh, so they stick to fur and they stick to clothing, and it's a way that plants can can move their seeds around to new areas and uh, move their uh, species uh, all over the place. Uh, the seed pods have little hooks. Uh, the burr has little hooks that snag onto fur and fibers. And Velcro is a, is a copy of this. The, the guy who invented Velcro in the late 40s uh, looked at... Uh, Mother Nature's burrs, they, they're visible under the optical microscope, and he copied it. Uh, now, he didn't have the best materials to work with, and so it was never practical from a commercial standpoint. Now, with modern uh, polymers, we're, we're developing the coarse hooks and the really fine fibers that grab on, uh, so we have Velcro, and we're all familiar with the rip of Velcro as you separate uh, uh, these materials. Uh, uh, Tremendous uh, copy of Mother Nature's uh, burr. Spider silk. Here's a spider web. 
is one of the strongest and toughest fibers known. And, and various spiders have different types of silk, and they spin different um, strengths and thicknesses when making a web. And the webs vary quite a bit. But it's a very tough and very strong fiber. And spiders spin these fibers out of spinnerets uh, from their body. Um, now, it's, as you can imagine, very difficult to herd spiders and to make them spin on demand and then to collect it. So uh, it's not very practical to herd spiders and use them as a source of uh, mass-produced materials. Uh, it's much worse than trying to herd cats. Um, so this is what a spider uh, silk looks like under the scanning electron microscope at 2,000 times magnification. Um, and what we have found that the ability to do or develop the ability to do is to uh, take goats, which can be herded quite nicely. My kids in 4-H had goats, and they herd pretty well. Uh, and what they've done is genetically engineer goats to produce milk that contains the spider silk protein. So they change the DNA uh, sequence in a goat so that its milk contains this spider silk protein instead of the proteins that would normally be present. Uh, and so they take the protein from the milk, they make a fiber out of it, um, and then they end up with a silk that's been trademarked as biosteel. Um, I said you can't herd spiders, but you can herd goats and you can get large quantities of milk with the silk, uh, fiber silk protein. Uh, and then you end up with a material that's 25% lighter than polymers, but it's extremely strong and tough. So it's better than the materials that we have been using. Get on to the next slide here. There we go. These are the mechanical properties of spiderweb silk compared to Kevlar. This is stress versus strain, typical stress-strain curve. Uh, the scale here is in gigapascal. Normally our tensile test results would be in megapascal. These materials are very strong and, and tough. Now Kevlar is very, very strong. It's not particularly tough. Uh, the area under the stress-strain curves for materials is an indication of their toughness, which is the energy required to cause and you'll see that the area under this curve, although it's very strong and stiff, is not very high. So the material is strong, but it's not, not particularly tough. Spider dragline silk has a stress train curve that looks like this. There is a elastic portion down here, and then it goes on and becomes a ductile material. Uh, and it has a high area under this curve when it fails at about 1.4 gigapascal, which makes it stronger than steel. Uh, and we end up then with a very tough and very strong material. So it's very strong. It is ductile. Uh, it is high, has high toughness. Uh, the strengths are in gigapascal, which makes it stronger than steel, uh, and of course much lighter. And so it's a very interesting material. This is a screw made out of silk in order to uh, mend bones that have been broken or shattered. Um, or where there are problems uh, uh, along that line. Uh, metal screws have traditionally been used, uh, and all kinds of other rods and so forth, uh, to, to uh, reinforce fractured bones while they heal. Uh, and metal screws are very strong, but they place stresses on the bones uh, and the tissue surrounding them so that uh, they can cause problems. They also interfere with x-rays. So when you have to look at how well the bone is mending, you have these metal screws and other uh, structures in there that might block the view uh, somewhat of the fracture area. And after the bone has healed, you have to go in for another surgery and remove the steel screws and rods and so forth. They can't normally be left in place. Uh, silk screws, however, uh, degrade in slowly in the body. But they are strong and they are pliable during the healing process. So they don't uh, pre place nearly the amount of stress on the bones as they heal. And this makes them especially useful for children uh, and their growing bones because healing takes time, but the bones are growing, uh, which causes a problem with, with metal structures. 
Uh, so these are uh, a, a real advance, particularly for young people, uh, for repairing broken, smashed uh, bones. This was in National Geographic also in 2014. Thank you for listening. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this lecture. It just gives you a feel for uh, some of the uh, newer areas of material technology and science. Uh, so um, uh, I hope you'll look into this further. There are lots of references and lots of other examples uh, along this line. Just an area that really has interested me uh, along with typical material science and manufacturing technology. Thank you again.